This is the John Brack we know and love. Here's a vision of Melbourne in the 1950s, drab and doer. The painting of Collins Street shows them as drained of all emotion, coming out of their offices at five o'clock, surging towards the station, passing without looking. I know that because I stood in the doorway every night watching them, and they didn't even notice that there was somebody drawing them. Brack later regretted this painting. He felt that as an artist he'd taken too superior a tone, as if only he, the artist, could see the limits of 1950s lifestyle and that all these ignorant drones just went along without thinking about it. This, in contrast, is apparently what Brack really wanted to say. He spent the last decades of his life dedicating his considerable talent to painting these landscapes of pencils, puppets and postcards. What people really want hanging on the wall is something pretty. Uh, it's what people have always wanted to hang on the wall, something pretty. And they don't want uh, 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 something that they have to think about. They certainly don't want the floor, no. All along, Brack felt that we, the public, the critics, just didn't get it. We oversimplified his art. So now, ten years after his death, do we finally understand precisely what Brack was trying to say? You've been living with this art for months and months. Do you get Brack now? Um, it's something that I've written about, you know, it's that interest in people and in human nature, the human condition. Um, and so if, if you have that in your mind, I think that often helps understand some of the more, um, perhaps, esoteric uh, images. Mm -hmm. You can loathe them and love them in equal measure, but there's no love in the work. And uh, they, they seem monastic as if he shielded himself away from ordinary people. He seems to loathe ordinary people. Ouch! At least there's one point on which nearly everyone agrees. Brack was first and foremost a conceptual artist, a real ideas man. Viewers smiled wryly at what they thought was the satirical tone of these very formal images of banal Melbourne shops. But for Brack, a painting like The Block was a reference to the recent carnage of World War II and especially the Holocaust. Brack made no paintings while serving in the army during World War II. But he certainly did once the war was over. As far as I'm concerned, 1945 was the big turning point in history. And one of the consequences of this, it appeared to me then, was that uh, henceforth, irony uh, was the only attitude that the artist could take. He thought there was a contract that existed between the artist and the viewer, and it was the artist's job to make the picture to fill it with meaning or irony or whatever. Um, and then it was the viewer's job to work that out, and he wasn't interested in explaining it. I think he was often disappointed. I think early on he was frustrated that people saw the images just as simple satire. If you look at the stipendiary stewards, you might say, look, Brack's an observer. He's at the racetrack and his eyes being caught by this strange, shonky little cubby house crowded with stewards watching the race. Or is he reaching for something larger? Is he trying to make this into a memory of the watchtowers of the European death camps? The harder you look at Brack's paintings, the more layers of meaning begin to reveal themselves. Explorations of big ideas, as well as the minutiae of Brack's own psyche, his own life experiences. John Brack was the working class lad made good. Against the odds, he's forged his place as the quintessential Melbourne painter. The work, you've got to remember, is, is really telling about the 50s and how sterile Melbourne was then. So it's to the point, it's, it's full of courage. You do get people reflecting on Melbourne and saying it was just dead, there was nothing going on. You know, you go out in Melbourne on, on, a, on a Sunday afternoon, it was like a cultural wasteland. Brack found his subjects in the urban world around him. While his contemporaries painted the outback landscape, or in Brack's words, boring bushrangers, 
he turned his critical gaze on city life. The hard men of racing, of footy. The drinkers rushing to join the six o'clock swill. After Collins Street 5pm, Brack's most recognised work is the bar, a painting that has fascinated historian Claire Wright for a long time. Although we've come to associate pubs with male culture, with a male domain, if you talk to most people, they will list the names of female publicans they've known. And I think Brack brings that to this painting in the way that he makes it a quintessentially Australian painting, not a European painting like the Manet one. In a sense, it was a kind of uh, debeautification of Manet's Bar of the Folly Berger. In fact, there was just such a bar where the barmaid uh, was rather hatchet-faced and the drinkers were the ordinary sort of drinkers that drank between five and six in Melbourne. If we go back to that Manet painting, the, the, the barmaid in that has that sexualised figure, the hourglass figure, and, and her hands are positioned like this, which is a very vulnerable kind of way of holding herself as opposed to this woman who commands that space. This is her bar, she's saying. The next focus of Brack's social observation was the bizarre courtship ritual that is ballroom dancing. The champion ballroom dancers, it's a dream of what life might be like. I don't think it's a satire because that formality of his treatment of the figures uh, suggests that he's doing more than taking the mickey out of those fixed smiles and that heavy makeup. The idea is never quite clear or quite complete. I know some of the things that I want to say in the painting, but not everything. He seems to be trying to fuse figurative art and a more abstract treatment down here on the floorboards. The irony is that Brack was a card-carrying member of the anti-abstract movement. He wrote articles denouncing the shortcomings of abstraction. And then, after a European holiday in 1973, Brack abandoned the human figure almost entirely. He turned his full attention to pencils and scissors, postcards and playing cards, puppets, all sorts of things, except people. It was probably about 17 years before I found out what I had to say. In painting, one only knows that one wants to be an artist, but not what one's own particular task is. After 1973, Brack was certain for the rest of his career, he would explore, through his work, the plight of humankind, no less. Any artist who wants to tackle the big picture, the human condition in his art, is going to come up against a couple of problems. Now, in The White Men, Brack is talking to us of that long history of European colonial settlement. And you'll see all of these images of the white man as depicted by his colonial conquests, funneling down the canvas, distilling into this rather wretched screaming figure at the bottom. So what is Brack telling us? To wake up to the fact that our experience is based on a colonial history of some brutality? Or is he telling us that in the post-colonial era, these subject peoples are starting to talk back? Well, those are all contemplative issues. The painting itself doesn't give me an answer to any of those things. It can't. It's just a painting. You want to uh, make a statement and then give it a turn and then give it another turn and another turn and another turn until it becomes far more concentrated than it otherwise would be. With a painting like We, Us, Them, I mean, what are the layers? If you look at the tabletop, it's, you know, it's tilted like so many surfaces in Brack's pictures, and it's them, oh, is it us, down the bottom, and they're literally being pushed off the table. So again, it's that sort of, almost that cycle of life thing, you know, this is what happens again and again. We, we started up the top, but we've moved through, and now we're falling off the table. That's it.